Hello everyone, welcome to What If Issei's parents was killed by Kakabia Land becomes the Emperor's Champion Part 2. Before we start please go support Skinny40k for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Story information. If in the absence of the Adeptus Mechanicus during this particular era and the challenges involved in incorporating the Void Dragon, I have made the decision to address these aspects at a later stage. In lieu of the Adeptus Mechanicus, I have opted to introduce Hephaestus, the revered Greek deity of technology and creation, as well as the skilled dwarves of Svartifheim, renowned for their expertise in crafting weapons and armor. These entities will now assume the responsibility of furnishing the custodians and starts with new technology and the necessary materials for forging weapons and armor. This substitution of the Adeptus Mechanicus results in substantial alterations to the narrative, as the Emperor now relies on the superior weaponry crafted by these skilled artisans, who also contribute to humanity's technological progress. The dexterous craftsmanship possessed by the dwarven artisans played a pivotal role in my decision to present the story in its current form. To provide additional context, I have appended supplementary notes to the conclusion of the prologue. It is important to note that the Emperor's plan does not seek the extermination of all indigenous beings from the supernatural realm on Earth. Only those entities that have inflicted significant harm upon humanity or possess the potential to do so will be targeted. For instance, the Yakai will be afforded the opportunity to engage in peace negotiations, allowing for self-governance within their own territory. Conversely, vampires and similar races will be eradicated due to their predatory nature towards humanity. Furthermore, the creation process of the Custodians closely aligns with that of Warhammer 40k. The Emperor establishes connections with families from the human world who willingly offer their unborn children for the Custodians' conversion process. This process involves infusing the unborn child, while still within their mother, with the Emperor's DNA to initiate the Custodians' creation. It is crucial to note that this practice adheres to the Warhammer canon, albeit occurring slightly earlier in the timeline. As mentioned earlier, the Emperor possesses around a thousand years of technological advancements ahead of the rest of the world. Velkader, being depicted as younger in the story, exhibits enhanced psychic capabilities. Keeping true to his established abilities, it is my intention to employ a feat from the story's canon, where he employed his powers of manipulation to relocate the Moon of Titan into a pocket dimension within the warp. This pocket dimension will endure for an extended period, with the passage of time unfolding dissimilarly compared to the physical realm. I plan to seamlessly integrate the significant event either in the forthcoming chapter or subsequent ones. While maintaining fidelity to the established canons of both universes, my objective entails the masterful fusion of these realms, judiciously allowing for certain creative liberties. The persona of the Emperor shall remain unaltered, with the added layer of a profound emotional bond with Issei, effectively forged from the onset of the narrative. Essentially, Issei shall be depicted as the Emperor's offspring, owing to the genetic transformation process undergone by the former, thereby establishing a biological connection to the latter. Furthermore, our portrayal of the Emperor shall exhibit an elevated reverence towards select supernatural entities. Furthermore, it is imperative to note that the Emperor's capabilities shall be enhanced. This augmentation shall render him akin to a deity within the contemporary timeline, surpassing his previous standing in the canonical Warhammer 40k chronology, that is, prior to his seclusion on the Golden Throne. The passage of time has brought about transformative changes, resulting in a divergence from past events. Evidently, due to the current limitations in spatial exploration and the inability to access the warp gate on Molich, the Emperor remains incapable of attaining direct communion with the Chaos Gods. However, his comprehension of the imminent peril posed by these deities persists. Under alternative circumstances, he would have willingly forged a pact for additional power, but alas, given the present constraints, alternative means shall be devised to surmount this predicament. I have made an attempt to construct a coherent narrative by providing explanations for the protagonist's achievements in both technological and other realms. To accomplish this, I have incorporated various characters from the DXD world and mythologies who possess exceptional craftsmanship skills. However, it is worth noting that the Emperor maintains a merciless attitude towards those who exhibit disregard for humanity. This principle also applies to Issei, as they do not actively seek out supernatural factions unless they pose a direct threat or provoke anger. Currently, the Emperor is engaging in collaboration with scientists in order to enhance the Adeptus Astartes. The initial contingent of Astartes will be utilizing the genetic material of Issei. Furthermore, the Emperor has achieved the transformation of ordinary humans into pseudo astarts employing a process akin to the one employed when the Emperor discovered the Primarches. As a result, an army has been created that possesses a level of power that is nearly on par with the Astartes. These enhanced pseudo astarts will comprise the Crimson Dragon Legion. Additionally, the Emperor intends to include children of a young age who can undergo the Astartes project with the Assay's Gene Seed, effectively making himself the first Primarch. 
However, it is impractical to replicate the method by which he was created due to its high fatality rate and low chances of success. The nations aligned with the Imperium's military will be organized into the Imperial Guard, while the constructed warships will be incorporated into the Imperial Navy, each equipped with their own specialized units and branches. Cause and Effect Part 1 Casual Armor and Look After Obtaining the Biblical God's Powers and Divinity Battle Armor After just one week since the Emperor had displayed his immense power against the fallen angels, decimating half of their population, notifications were swiftly dispatched to inform all factions and pantheons of the Emperor's ascension to the throne of God. This fulfilled the final wish of his dear friend. Initially hesitant, the Emperor soon realized the urgent need for a new leader among the angels, someone who could not only guide them, but also have them aid humanity as his friend had desired. It became clear that by assimilating the divine remnants of God's power from Gabriel's locket and ascending to the divine throne, the Emperor would acquire extraordinary strength, adding on to his already enormous power and strength to elevate humanity and effectively ward off the intrusion of the chaos gods at present. Moreover, this would ensure the boy's safety until he was prepared to face the challenges ahead. With the acceptance of this momentous offer, the heavens witnessed the birth of a new era. The emperor wasted no time in initiating the reset of the sacred gear system, ensuring its exclusive use for humans alone. Those who were half-breeds or had been transformed into devils or any other entity that stripped them of their humanity were excluded. This bold move was a testament to the emperor's determination to rectify the use of the sacred gears against humans themselves. He also intended to purge the leadership that had plagued the churches and to overhaul the entire celestial system. A new dawn had arrived, bringing with it a surge of excitement and hope that swept through the heavens. In the majestic throne room of heaven, the esteemed leaders of the West and East Yakai factions had gathered for a momentous meeting with the revered emperor. Their purpose was to engage in thoughtful discussions and establish harmonious agreements. They fervently hope that the emperor will treat their faction fairly, contrasting the treatment given to the vampires and succubus factions. In attendance at this momentous gathering are Valder, Malkader, Michael, and the Emperor himself. The leaders of the Yakai's East and West factions arrived personally for this crucial meeting. It was of utmost importance for Kitsune Yasaka, the leader of the West, and Nekashu Karara, the leader of the East, to establish a friendly relationship and address their concerns. As they entered the throne room, they were greeted by the Emperor's loyal custodian guards, who ensured the sanctity and security of this auspicious occasion. Lady Karara leader of the East Yakai mother of Kuroka and Shirin, Lady Yasaka leader of the West Yakai, Emperor. Your urgent request for an audience has taken me by surprise, Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara. Yasaka. We have been made aware of the recent events involving the vampires and succubus, and we believe it is imperative to discuss these matters with you. Karara. Our concern lies in the possibility of the Yakai faction becoming the next target. We have come here in search of peace or, if necessary, to surrender to you. The Yakai faction holds no ill intentions towards humanity or your divine goals, Almighty God Emperor. Isaka. We sincerely wish no harm upon humanity, and we humbly beseech you to spare our people. Both Karara and Yasaka bowed respectfully before the Emperor. Emperor. Haha, Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara, rest assured that there is no need for concern. I have no intention of targeting the Yakai. I am fully aware that your race did not partake in the massacre of humans during the Great War. I am also fully aware of what's going on within your faction. Isaka and Karara rose from their humble bow, their astonishment evident as they witnessed the Emperor's unexpectedly carefree demeanor. The weight of their worries lifted, replaced by a sense of relief and a surge of joy and curiosity. Isaka. Nevertheless, we would like to align ourselves with your faction. We genuinely seek to establish positive relations with both you Emperor and humanity. I understand your actions against the vampires and succubus, as they have consistently posed a threat to humanity and needed to be addressed. I am relieved to know that our faction was never a target, Karara. Almighty God Emperor, you mentioned being aware of the events within our faction. Emperor. Yes, I am aware. Karara rushed forward, coming to a stop at the foot of the Emperor's throne. Then she fell to her knees, desperately pleading for his assistance. Karara. Almighty God Emperor, I humbly implore you to intervene. The devils have taken my two beloved daughters, as well as numerous innocent children and families. They were snatched away cruelly due to the devil's fear of the extraordinary powers possessed by both the Nekamata and Nekashu, these powers are coveted by the devils, yet remain beyond their grasp. You understand the consequences that arise when one desires a power they cannot possess a threat is perceived. Therefore, I beg you, God Emperor, to consider the dire repercussions that await us if the devils are unable to obtain this power and resort to extinguishing it. Please, comprehend the anguish that consumes me, as humans have suffered a similar fate when their powers became unattainable for the devils. I am prepared to sacrifice my own life for your cause, but I beseech you, please, save them. 
our faction lacks the strength to combat the devil's forces, and they will undoubtedly execute or subject them to agonizing experiments. As a mother, I beg you, please, save my daughters Kuroka and Shirin. Balder was prepared to have the custodians escort both Yakai out of the throne room. Their blatant disrespect to ask anything of the Emperor when they themselves are here asking to form the alliance, not the Emperor inviting them. But that's when the Emperor raised his hand, halting Valder. The Emperor closed his eyes, immersing himself in the images of the cries and screams for help that emanated through the warp. He witnessed innocent humans being massacred simply because they possessed powers that the supernatural realm could not control, particularly the devils and fallen angels. After a moment, he reopened his eyes, rose from his throne, and walked down to the Nekashu, placing a comforting hand on the weeping yakai, surprising everyone. Barara lifted her head, tears streaming down her face, her gaze filled with hope as she looked upon the kneeling figure of the Emperor. Emperor. I comprehend your anguish, witnessing the merciless slaughter and experimentation inflicted upon your own race, merely because they possess powers that others cannot control. Given your role as a mother, it is understandable that your desperation to save your children deeply moves me. The empathy I feel towards your situation is not only reasonable but also heartfelt. Therefore, I shall grant the alliance, wherein the Yakai faction will join the expanding and flourishing Imperium of Man as an autonomous domain and sovereign territory. Gerara with teary eyes, her voice choked with emotion, thank you, I promise to repay your kindness. Emperor. Do not express gratitude just yet, for the task remains unfinished. Regard this as a gesture of peace and a significant stride towards showcasing our unity for the future alliance. And you shall play a pivotal role in the new Imperium of Man that I am forging. Isaka. Does this mean we will be under your protection? Emperor. Yes, I declare this in the presence of all who bear witness, and it shall serve as a notice to the other pantheons. The Yakai faction, encompassing both the East and West, now falls under the protection of the God Emperor of Mankind and the flourishing Imperium of Man. Michael, I require your assistance in this matter. Michael. Of course, my lord. I am more than willing to provide whatever aid is needed to the best of my abilities. Emperor. I request that you initiate the process of negotiating our sovereign domain agreement in collaboration with Yusaka and Karara. Additionally, outline our expectations, including the deployment of our forces and the establishment of defensive measures within both the East and West Yakai territories. Currently, the Golden Legion is already stretched in, and I would prefer not to further divide their forces. Instead, I request that you dispatch a division of angels to both the east and west regions. Their task will be to reinforce the defenses and prepare for any potential retaliation arising from our intervention in the Devil's Affairs, in response to our rescue missions for the Nekamata and Nekashu. Michael. Leave it to me, my lord. I will outline the terms and ensure that the angels are deployed to the Yakai territories to fortify their defenses. Emperor. Excellent. Now, Valder, how many members of the Golden Legion are currently available? Valder. To be completely transparent, we currently have a pool of 4,700 skilled custodians available for missions and protection. Additionally, we have more than enough spare equipment at our disposal. If the primary focus of this mission is the rescue of hostages, I propose that our primary requirement should be air support from Ares fighters and Marauder bombers. Furthermore, in order to effectively evacuate the hostages, we will require multiple Thunderhawks. To provide an accurate estimate, we would need 50 Ares fighters to establish complete air supremacy and divert the attention of the devils away from our rescue operation. Out of these fighters, 25 will provide support to our bombers, while the remaining fighters will escort the Thunderhawks during the evacuation process. Additionally, we will need 20 Marauder bombers to execute strategic bombings on the capital of Lilith. To ensure the safe evacuation of all the kidnapped hostages, we will require 5 Thunderhawks. For effective ground support during the mission, it will be imperative to have two or ion assault dropships. Each dropship has the capacity to accommodate 25 custodians. Their primary role will be to assist the hostages in reaching the Thunderhawk securely. Emperor. All right, prepare the forces to mobilize within the next hour. Alder. Understood, my lord. Karara. Wait, do you know where they have taken them? Emperor. I mentioned earlier that I have an idea of what has been happening, and I have been monitoring the devils closely, especially their movements. I have observed a significant transfer of living prisoners towards the Nibirius estate, a clan notorious for their sadistic treatment of humans and other races. Isaka. It's amazing how you are able to track the activities and movements of supernatural beings. May I inquire how you are able to do so? Emperor. That is not something you need to concern yourself with. Just understand I've been keeping a watchful eye on the devils in particularly lately. So no matter how insignificant they may appear, I pay attention. I have come to learn that the supernatural realm, including gods, devils, and fallen angels, can be merciless and cruel. Isaka. It's truly incredible. 
I can see why the entire supernatural world is fearful of you, in regards of what you're capable of. Yet, I also recognize that you are a fair and just leader. Your actions here with me have demonstrated that clearly. I am happy to be a part of the new alliance and the founding of your blossoming imperium, almighty god emperor. Emperor. Excellent. Michael, would you please escort both Lady Karara and Lady Asaka to a separate room to discuss the terms of the alliance. I would have liked to handle it myself, but I currently have other pressing matters to attend to. I hope you understand Lady Asuka and Lady Karara, I mean no offense. Isaka. No offense taken at all. You have been tirelessly working for the Yakai faction, and we have learned that you have no ill intentions towards us. I am grateful that we were able to reach an agreement for an alliance, and I appreciate your efforts. So thank you almighty god emperor. Karara. I must express my deep gratitude for your assistance in saving my kin and my two daughters. I am forever in your debt, and I pledge my loyalty and devotion to the Imperium of Man and to you, Almighty Emperor. Both Yasaka and Karara once again bowed to the Emperor before straightening up. Emperor. Very well then, I am pleased to have this alliance with both of you. Michael, could you please escort them to a room to discuss the terms while I attend to other matters? Michael. Yes, my lord. Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara, please follow me to my office so we can discuss the alliance agreements and the status of your sovereign territory, among other things. After that, Michael led the Yakai letters out to discuss the terms of the alliance and their sovereign domain, leaving only the custodian guards in the throne room, along with Valder, Malkader, and the Emperor. Malkader. Neath, I am quite surprised that you agreed to assist the Yakai. May I ask a reason behind your decision? I understand your desire to form the Imperium, not just as a great empire for humanity, but also to establish treaties with other species. However, the Yakai, my lord. Valder. I must admit, my emperor, that I am also curious about this matter. Emperor. It's quite simple, Valder. This was before your time, but let me explain. Melkader, do you remember why Lady Yasaka is significant to me? Melkader. Yes, I vividly recall the events. They faced a plight similar to that of humanity, albeit for different reasons. It all began when the Kitsune leader, driven by compassion, made the courageous decision to aid humanity in escaping the purge initiated by the other factions, more precisely the fallen angels and devils, towards the end of the Great War. However, this noble act painted a target on their backs, as the more powerful factions relentlessly pursued them. Consequently, the Kitsunes, once abundant, now teeter on the brink of extinction, save for the sole survivor, Yusaka. Countless valiant yakai sacrificed their lives in their unwavering commitment to assist humanity during our darkest hour. And if my memory serves me right, Daisuke, on the verge of death, entrusted you with the protection of his beloved daughter, Yusaka. If my recollection of your account upon your return is accurate. Emperor. Exactly. So then, you can see the parallels between the struggles faced by Karara, the Nekashu, and the Nekamata. The yakai helped humanity, and now they find themselves on the brink of extinction, or at least certain species of the yakai. Alder. Ah, I understand now, my lord. So, in a way, we are repaying our debts to the species that aided humanity during our darkest hours. The emperor closed his eyes, his mind drifting back to a memory. Flashback, towards the end of the Great War, Asuk wondered if he had succeeded in saving both humans and Yakai, as well as his wife and daughter. The emperor reassured him, saying, yes, we were able to save them. Just remain still, I can heal you. Asuk insisted, no, you must leave. They are still searching for you, along with the other perpetuals and psychers. You need to stay safe for their sake. The emperor expressed his concern, saying, but this isn't right. After everything you have done for humanity, many kitsunes have lost their lives because of it. I want to at least save you, so that your wife and child can have you in their lives. Asuk. No, my friend. You do not owe us anything. Coughs up blood we witnessed the injustices inflicted upon humanity simply because they possessed power and potential. We could not stand idly by and allow such atrocities to continue. We were aware of the risks involved, and we knew that we could lose our lives in aiding you, but we chose to do so regardless. And on behalf of my fallen comrades, I can confidently say that we have no regrets. The Emperor offered his apologies, his voice tinged with sadness, gratitude, and remorse. Asuk. Ah, cough cough it is truly a rare sight to see the Emperor of Mankind, who has always prioritized humanity above us supernatural beings, express such deep sadness and regret on behalf of a yakai like myself and my fallen comrades. However, I implore you, Emperor. Emperor. No, you may address me as Neath, for that is my name. It is the least I can offer in return for the kindness and support that the Kitsunes, you, and your comrades have shown to humanity. Asuk. Well, well. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine that I would be privileged enough to know the true name of the Emperor, haha. <laughs> cough 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 but Neath, time is of the essence, so I implore you to lend me your ear. Emperor. Of course, Daisuke, I am all ears. 
What do you need? Asuk. I humbly request that you watch over my beloved wife and cherished daughter, Yusaka, especially. Can you grant me this favor, Neath? Emperor. Without a doubt, I solemnly swear to fulfill your wish and protect your family. Asuk. I am truly grateful. In that moment, he raised his blood-stained arm, reaching out for the emperor to grasp, and the emperor willingly accepted. Daisuke firmly clasped the emperor's hands and began speaking. Daisuke. Have you ever pondered the significance behind my name, Daisuke? Emperor. If my memory serves me correctly, it translates to great help. Daisuke. You are indeed knowledgeable, Neath. But there is more to it than that. Among the Kitsunes, it signifies being a great help to those in need. Remember, Neath, that when someone is in true need of assistance, the favor shall be returned, just as the Kitsunes have aided you. Cough cough never forget that, Neath. Asuk released his grip on the Emperor's hand and, with a heavy heart, sank to the ground, succumbing to his wounds. The Emperor let out a pained sigh, deciding to give Daisuk a proper burial as a tribute to his newfound friend. The Emperor then made his way to meet with the other human psychers and perpetuals. As the Emperor paused and turned his head slightly, a profound sadness filled his voice as he spoke. Emperor. I understand the depth of your words, Daisuk. I solemnly vow to protect your beloved wife and daughter, just as I promised you. I will ensure that the sacrifices made by you and your comrades were not in vain. With unwavering resolve, the Emperor turned his gaze towards the unknown and embarked on a determined sprint through the darkness of the rain-soaked night until his silhouette disappeared completely. Flashback ends. Melkader. Neath, are you alright? Emperor, I apologize Melkader. I was lost in thought, reminiscing about a memory. But to answer your question, my friend, I am determined to honor the sacrifices made by those who have brought us to this point. The Yakai have aided us in the past, and it is only right that we offer our assistance to them now. Melkader. I understand and support your sentiments, Neath. Emperor. Excellent. Now, Valder, it is imperative that we honor our alliance with the Yakai and fulfill our obligations. I request that you make the necessary arrangements with our troops. It is time to not only send a clear message to the Devil Kings, but also to the misguided council. Valder. I understand, my lord. I will begin the preparations without delay. Please excuse me. Scene change. Underworld, currently in the Grigori, Azazel found himself seated at his desk, his body still wrapped in bandages, a constant reminder of the brutal encounter with the Emperor. As he read through the latest report outlining the aftermath of the message sent to the supernatural realm, Azazel couldn't help but reflect on the profound impact the Emperor had exerted on the faction of fallen angels. Azazel. Damn it all, not only did that bastard obliterate my painstaking research, but he also brought about the simultaneous annihilation of two different factions, through the infamous Golden Legion adding insult to injury, the already dwindling count of the fallen angels has been mercilessly decimated, with 50% of our population tragically wiped out, including prominent members like Shemhazai and Barakiel. As Azul clenched his fists in frustration feeling helpless, there was nothing he could do. That's when a knock was heard on Azazel's office door. Knock knock knock, Azazel. Come in. Enemy you? Azazel, I have the finished report of the states of the fallen angels. Azazel sighed before telling her to read him the report. And she nodded and began to read the report. Enemy you? Fallen Angel Causality Report. This report provides a detailed account of the aftermath and devastating consequences following the assault on the Grigori by a singular entity known as the Emperor of Mankind. The Emperor compelled all fallen angels within the facility to kneel before him and subsequently unleashed his power, resulting in the spontaneous combustion of fallen angels located within the facility, as well as those present in the underworld and the human world at that time. The repercussions of this catastrophic event, combined with the already diminishing numbers of fallen angels since the conclusion of the Great War, have left the angel population prior to the incident at a mere 65%. Furthermore, approximately 7% of the remaining population have defected, choosing to align themselves with the fallen angel Kakabiel, a member of the Cadre class. To compound the issue, the Emperor intentionally eliminated half of our current population, which included two esteemed Cadre members. Shemhazai and Barakiel. Furthermore, fallen angels from various classes were also targeted, ranging from high-ranking to mid-ranking to low-ranking individuals, resulting in a substantial reduction across all categories. The current findings of this report indicate that the surviving population is primarily concentrated in the high-ranking, mid-ranking, and low-ranking categories. The remaining distribution of fallen angels among different classes is as follows. High-ranking. 7%. Mid-ranking. 9%. Low-ranking. 13%. The current percentage of fallen angels stands at 29%, which is a cause for great concern. In addition, we have observed a significant rise in the number of angels from all classes, succumbing to the corrupting influence of Kakabiel. 
the exact figures regarding the fallen angels who joined Kakabiel's rebellion and the consequences they faced remain uncertain. It is evident that the actions of the emperor have impacted them irrespective of their whereabouts. Based on our estimates, it appears that he has lost a considerable number of followers, with the initial 7% now reduced to approximately 5 to 4%. End of report. Azazel. Damn that emperor, Enemu. There is more to report. We have received an additional message from heaven, containing the following contents. Azazel, governor of the fallen angels, we hereby inform you that a new leader has emerged in heaven. Our father's final testament has been discovered, unveiling his chosen successor to the heavenly throne. As per our father's last will, the emperor of mankind has been appointed as the rightful heir. Furthermore, he has been entrusted with the remnants of our father's immense power, specifically bestowed upon him. Our father's testament states that he relinquishes the seat and throne of heaven, granting the emperor of mankind the destiny of humanity and the prestigious title of God Emperor of Mankind. This is the definitive decree of our father. Consequently, our new leader has proclaimed a complete severance of all communication and ties with the fallen angels. Therefore, any previous agreements allowing your presence within our domain are now invalidated. You are given a limited time frame of 15 days to withdraw all your fallen angels, companies, and businesses from our territory. Failure to comply within the specified time will result in a thorough pursuit and elimination of all individuals associated with the fallen angels. End of letter. Azazel. Unbelievable. This cannot be happening. I assume these letters were distributed to the devils and even to some pantheons. Two factions have been completely eradicated, and our own faction is on the brink of extinction. Furthermore, we are contending with a renegade group of fallen angels. On top of it all, heaven is now under the emperor's control, shattering any hopes of forming an alliance. That despicable individual has always harbored the desire to elevate humanity above supernaturals. It comes as no surprise that my father trusted him, given their shared ideals. I am curious to see how the devils will respond to this news, undoubtedly, they will not take it lightly. I can only hope that the Devil Council exercises caution and refrains from any rash actions against him. Enemu? Given the recent revelations and the dire state of our population, it would be unwise to persist in our pursuit of Kakabiel. With a loss of two cadres and a significant reduction in our high-class to mid-class fallen angels, it is imperative that we reassess our plans. In my view, we should initiate a recall of all fallen angels to our side of the underworld and cease all activities in the human realm, considering our current population constraints. This approach would be the most prudent course of action, as we cannot afford to endure further losses or incite conflicts with other factions. It is in our best interest to issue a public announcement and dispatch letters to the various factions and pantheons, notifying them of our intention to withdraw all fallen angels to our realm. Additionally, we should provide them with pertinent information regarding the rogue fallen angels who have aligned themselves with Kakabiel, our rogue cadre. Azazel let out a heavy sigh, acknowledging the undeniable truth in the statement. Azazel. Very well. Initiate the necessary procedures to cease all operations of our businesses and companies in the human realm. Notify the remaining angels involved in the pursuit of Kakabiel that their mission has been terminated. Issue a summon for all fallen angels to return to the underworld. It is crucial that we communicate our decision to withdraw back to our territory in the underworld to the other factions. Ensure that we provide them with comprehensive information about our rogue agent, Kakabiel, and his followers, emphasizing that they are no longer affiliated with our faction. Enemu? Understood, I will take care of it. Enemu left Azazel to inform the rest of the fallen angels. Azazel. Damn it all, things are falling apart before they could really begin. Scene changed to an unknown location. The Kabiel. Damn it, Rizavim. Oh, what's got the crow all riled up? The Kabiel. Don't mess with me, Rizavim, you know exactly why I'm furious. Rizavim. Ah, it's because the Emperor has single handedly crushed your so called superior fallen angel race and decimated your numbers. The Kabiel. That damned emperor ruined my plans and all because I was trying to kill a worthless human boy, Viteria. It's not surprising, given the emperor's inclination towards humanity. What truly intrigues me is his decision to protect a boy rumored to possess a longinus. It raises questions about the boy's unique abilities and what caught the emperor's interest. The Kabiel. It is irrelevant now. The boy is no more. I have eliminated him, along with his family. I must confess, I took pleasure in violating his mother. Haha. <laughs> Viteria. You're such a vile and disgusting creature, Kakabiel. You are simply repugnant, Shalba. That is enough I have no interest in the plight of the fallen angels or their dwindling faction. They are inferior to us devils. Soon, the emperor of mankind will witness the subjugation of humanity at the hands of us devils, Kakabiel. Ah, the descendant of a deceased fool who was stripped of his position. Haha. <laughs> While my race may be facing extinction, I am more than capable of eliminating you, descendant of Beelzebub. Rizavim. 
All right, everyone, let's remember that as members of the Cow's Brigade, we share the same goal. However, I cannot ignore the concerns raised by the Emperor's sudden appearance after millennia. Office, I would like to hear your thoughts on this matter. Office. As long as he doesn't interfere with my desire for solitude, I have no objections. But if he becomes an obstacle, I will deal with him. Rizavum. That is reassuring. Now, Kakabiel, there is still a chance for you to reignite the Great War. However, we must approach it differently, correct? Kakabiel. I am all ears. Please, continue. Rizavum with a cunning smile, I am delighted to share my plan with you. Cause and effect part 2. 45 minutes later, the custodians were preparing the Ares fighters, marauder bombers, or ion assault dropships, and thunderhicks for the mission. Currently, the leader of the mission is giving a debriefing to the team. Suddenly, Baldur and Lady Carrara approached him to inform them of a last-minute addition to their mission. Custodian Commander. Shield Captain Baldur, your presence is unexpected. Unit, attention. Baldur. Please, relax. I am here to share important information with you. Someone will be joining you on your mission to rescue the Yakai. Custodian Commander. May I ask who will be joining us? Baldur. It will be Lady Karara, the esteemed leader of the East Yakai. Her presence is crucial to assure her people of our pure intentions, provide them with a sense of security, and facilitate their safe transfer onto the Thunderhicks without any hesitation. Custodian Commander. Understood, Captain. Thank you for informing me. Baldur's message was clear. Custodians have been assigned to safeguard Lady Karara during the mission. The rest of the custodians involved in the mission know their duties. For those also assisting in the rescue of the Yakai, your responsibility is simple. Rescue the imprisoned Yakai and ensure their safety during the evacuation. And, importantly, show no mercy to the devils. Excitement filled the hangar as the custodians and Lady Karara prepared for the rescue mission. Lady Karara was surrounded by custodians donned in their golden armor and received a clear briefing on their mission. The commander, an experienced veteran, explained the dangerous part of the underworld they would navigate to reach the Nibirius estate near the capital of Lilith, where the imprisoned Yakai were being held. The commander emphasized the need for precise coordination and unwavering discipline for this rescue mission. The custodians were given the responsibility to safely escort the Yakai to the Thunderhicks without any harm coming to them. They understood the importance of this task and were prepared to do whatever it took to ensure the Yakai's safety. But the briefing concluded, preparations began. The custodian commander began giving the orders to start boarding their assigned ships. Orion assault dropships, Thunderhicks, Ares fighters, and Marauder bombers. Lady Carrara, with her designated bodyguards, would stay with her throughout the mission, aiding in the search and rescue of the Yakai, using her abilities to locate them in the mansion. Once everyone was aboard their assigned ships, the roars of engines coming to life could be heard throughout the hangar, as the ships began to gracefully hover above the hangar floor, ready for takeoff. The custodians, through their comms, were given the signal to begin takeoff. First were the bombers with their fighter escorts, next were the thunderhicks accompanied by their fighter escorts, along with the Orion assault dropships following suit, ascending out of the fortress hangar bays. The hangar was engulfed in a brilliant display of thrusters and propulsion, a testament to the might of the Imperium of Man. After a few minutes all the aircraft, including fighters, bombers, thunderhicks and Orion dropships, swiftly took to the air, organized in their designated formations. Shortly after, a communication was sent from the air traffic control bridge to all ships, relaying the message that the portal to the underworld was now open and ready for their departure. Without hesitation, all ships entered the portal, which was promptly closed behind them. Their destination. The underworld, where their mission would begin. As they journeyed towards their objectives, all those involved, be it the custodians and the pilots, shared a common mindset. They were prepared to fulfill the Emperor's will and unleash his righteous wrath. Lady Carrara, filled with a mix of nervousness, anticipation, and determination, sought to not only free her captured people, but also rescue her two daughters from the clutches of the devils. She felt immense gratitude towards the Emperor for providing his elite guards and granting her the opportunity to accompany them on the mission. Moreover, she was determined to prove her loyalty and dedication to the God Emperor of Mankind, and his glorious Imperium filled her with eagerness. Together, they all embraced the oath to the Emperor and their unwavering belief in the grand vision of the Imperium of Man. This conviction propelled them forward with unwavering tenacity and unbreakable will. As they ventured deeper into the unknown, the resolute voice of the Emperor resonated within their minds, solidifying their unity and shared purpose. They were bound together by their sacred duty to the Emperor and ready to take on anything that would get in the way of the Emperor's plans for humanity or its allies. They were ready to conquer any obstacle that dared to oppose them. Scene change. Underworld, capital city Lilith, within the heavily fortified castle, the Devil Kings convened in a meeting room. The air was tense as they gathered to discuss the recent events surrounding the Emperor's actions and his ascent to the Heavenly Throne. Surziches. 
My sincerest apologies, but we cannot remain silent any longer. It is imperative that we address the recent developments concerning the Emperor and his newfound position. Seraphal, have you received any updates from your contacts within other factions and pantheons? Seraphal. Unfortunately, I have not obtained much information from the other factions and pantheons. However, reports suggest that they are greatly surprised and filled with fear due to the recent actions of the Emperor. The powerful Golden Legion has annihilated the Succubi and Vampire factions, and the Emperor himself has dealt significant damage to the Fallen Angels. This has left various factions and pantheons feeling uneasy and focused on strengthening their defenses. They are worried that the Golden Legion might be unleashed upon them, equipped with their formidable weapons of war. Ajuka. Additionally, we must consider the Emperor's potential ability to create angels, similar to the Biblical God. This poses a numerical threat to us. Their numbers could increase at a faster rate than ours, even with the evil pieces. This is a troubling concern. Moreover, I have come across some interesting information that has led me to conduct further investigation. Through extensive research, I have discovered a perplexing phenomenon related to certain humans turned devils who possess sacred gears. They are experiencing a loss of functionality. However, I have managed to uncover a plausible explanation for this peculiar occurrence. Serzichas. Please, continue Ajuka. Ajuka. Allow me to present a theory based on meticulous examination of the available data. It is highly conceivable that, following the Emperor's ascension to the throne of heaven, he not only embarked on the challenging task of restoring and modifying the heaven system, but also endeavored to rectify and modify the sacred gear system. It is plausible that he engineered alterations to the system, specifically limiting the privilege of wielding sacred gears exclusively to humans. Though it remains uncertain whether this revelation extends to angels as well, it has become evident that humans transformed into devils or fallen angels experience a complete eradication of their sacred gears. Regrettably, even individuals with a lineage derived from the union of a human and a devil have been stripped of their sacred gears. It appears that the Emperor has orchestrated a restructuring of the sacred gear system to empower humans exclusively. While uncertainty lingers, this explanation seems to be the most plausible and provides insight into the unfortunate loss of sacred gears experienced by many of our reincarnated devils. Upon hearing this disheartening revelation, frustration and rage consumed Serzich's. Succumbing to an overwhelming surge of emotions, he forcefully slammed his fist upon the table, bellowing, damn it, this revelation significantly diminishes the power we acquired through the utilization of sacred gears in the reincarnation process. Albium, deeply concerned, interjected, this poses an alarming predicament. It seems that the fundamental essence of bestowing the power of a sacred gear upon a human, regardless of its strength or origin, is irreversibly severed upon their reincarnation. The implications of this revelation are dire indeed, as Ajuka mentioned the possibility of the Emperor being able to create angels, paralleling the abilities of the Biblical God himself. This exacerbates an already precarious situation, given that our numbers cannot increase as rapidly as desired through the utilization of evil pieces, not to mention the formidable threat posed by the Emperor's Golden Legion, armed with their formidable weapons of war. Furthermore, the prospect of enraging the Emperor and invoking his wrath, should we provoke him, spells utter doom for us. This news was undoubtedly troubling, and Seraphal, her voice laced with worry, chimed in, this is deeply concerning. My beloved Sotan will face significant challenges in assembling formidable members for her peerage. Furthermore, the predicament is even more dire for young Rias, Serzichas, as she heavily relies on recruiting individuals who possess sacred gears to strengthen her peerage with powerful and reliable members. The room filled with a heavy silence as everyone present absorbed the weight of this revelation. The newfound understanding brought about a significant change, limiting the resources and power accessible to both fallen angels and devils. The once promising avenue of sacred gears now seemed out of reach, reserved solely for humans. Each member of the assembly held a combination of frustration, despair, and an unwavering determination to find alternative methods to bolster their respective clans against this formidable obstacle. Serzichas. Ajuka, is there a way we can circumvent this problem? Ajuka. Unfortunately, I don't see a viable solution. Gaining access to the sacred gear system itself appears highly improbable. Furthermore, attempting to remove sacred gears from humans as a potential solution could provoke a hostile reaction from the Emperor, further complicating our predicament. Palbium. What adds to the disconcerting nature of this situation is that users of sacred gears can significantly bolster a faction's strength. As a result, our military finds itself in a dire position, given that the humans who possess sacred gears can no longer utilize them. This has weakened a significant portion of our military force, placing us in a rather dire predicament. Scene change. In the skies above Lilith, the capital city, Fighter Squad Alpha assembled. The leaders and members prepared for the imminent battle ahead. 
The fighter leader analyzed the situation carefully as the group of Thunderhicks and their fighter escorts advanced towards the Nibirius estate. At the same time, marauder bombers descended upon the city. Urgency filled the air, highlighted by the commanding voice of the fighter leader. The marauder leader acknowledged the plan's execution clearly and concisely. The squad began their run with meticulous precision, intensifying the tension in the skies. The fighter leader reiterated his instructions, emphasizing the need to protect the bomber's course while remaining vigilant against threats. Each squadron, comprised of three fighters, confirmed their understanding with unwavering determination. Devoted to the cause, they embraced their roles in safeguarding the marauder bombers. Leading a squadron of 13 fighters, the fighter leader united their resolve with an impassioned rallying cry, invoking the strength of humanity and the revered emperor. Their words echoed like a steadfast battle hymn, affirming their unwavering loyalty and dedication to their cause. A deep invisible bond formed among the comrades as they echoed the sentiments of the fighters, each reaffirming their allegiance to the emperor, a symbol of hope in the darkest times. Meanwhile, on the streets of Lilith, an innocent devil child looked up with curiosity at the unbelievable spectacle unfolding above. The child's concerned mother gazed upward, instantly overcome by fear. Recognizing the impending danger, she swiftly picked up her child and urged others to flee. However, before she could fully utter her warning, the first rockets hit their targets, engulfing the city in a chaotic display of fire. High above, the Marauder Squad reported the initial success of their bombing run, ruthlessly obliterating designated locations. Unfazed by the inexplicable destruction below, the Marauder leader confidently ordered their return to the skies, poised for the second phase of their assault. Rallying his team, he emphasized their duty to unleash the Emperor's wrath upon the vile inhabitants of the underworld. With unwavering duty and allegiance to the Emperor and the Imperium of Man, the brave fighters and bombers pressed on with their relentless assault. The scene transitions back to the conference room with the Devil Kings, where a palpable tension hangs in the air. Seraphal, Serzichas, and Ajuka exchange worried glances, their expressions reflecting the gravity of the situation. Suddenly, the room quakes with a series of thunderous explosions. Wide-eyed, Seraphal exclaims, what in the underworld is going on? Serzichas, the compassed and level-headed leader, furrows his brow and demands, what caused those explosions? Acting swiftly, Ajuka rushes towards the window, desperate to assess the unfolding chaos. Within moments, he comprehends the severity of the situation and shouts, everyone, you must see this we are under attack. Startled and perplexed, Falbium questions, but how did they breach our supposedly impenetrable barriers? The tension in the room reaches its peak when suddenly, the conference room door swings open with force. A disheveled devil, panting and visibly shaken, stumbles forward, desperately trying to regain their composure. They urgently deliver the dire news to the devil kings. But desperation etched on their face, the devil gasps, my esteemed lords, the Golden Legion has initiated an assault against us. The scene abruptly shifts to the Nibirius estate, plunged into absolute chaos. Devils scramble in terror, their lives hanging in the balance as they witness the unparalleled speed and efficiency of the Golden Legion's onslaught. Devil 1. We must flee the Emperor's formidable Golden Legion is assaulting us with great force. Devil 2. Who are these humans? They are mercilessly decimating us. We can't even strike a single blow against them, their speed is unimaginable for a human to have. In just a short span of time, they have already eliminated half of the guards stationed within the mansion. In the midst of chaos, the custodian commander personifies authority, exhibiting resolute determination. Their firm voice cuts through the chaos, proclaiming, eliminate all enemy forces and create an escape route for the prisoners Lady Carrara, utilize your extraordinary senses and have the assigned custodians acting as your personal guards for this mission. Accompany you for both protection and assistance in locating the Yakai, liberating them and safely escorting them to the Thunderhicks for evacuation. Our aim is to extract the prisoners securely, neutralize any potential threats, and ensure their unhindered passage to the Thunderhicks, thus safeguarding their well-being. Barara, compassed and resolute, acknowledges the instructions. Using her Senjutsu abilities, she swiftly locates not only her fellow Nekamata and Nekashu, but also her two daughters. With this information in hand, she immediately sets off in their direction, unwavering in her determination. The custodians dutifully follow, ready to assist and protect her at all costs. As the operation unfolds, the commander's communication device crackles to life, relaying vital updates. Commander. Kill team, have you successfully located Lord Nibirius? Custodians. Affirmative. We have confirmed his location and are preparing to engage. Commander. Proceed as planned. With a renewed sense of determination, the custodians acknowledge the orders and terminate the communication, fully prepared to carry out their mission with precision. Observing the unfolding situation, the commander calmly remarks, it appears that everything is progressing according to our meticulous plans. Scene change. Barara and her escorts entered the mansion, heading towards the dungeons where she sensed the kidnapped yakai were being held. 
Upon reaching the heavily fortified door leading to the dungeon, Karara expressed her frustration, stating that the yakai they were searching for were behind that very door. One of the custodians, taking charge, instructed Karara to step back. He positioned himself in front of the door and, with a swift powerful kick, broke the door off its hinges. The door was sent flying across the dungeon until it collided with the dungeon wall, breaking the wall upon impact and shattering the door into pieces. Karara was awestruck by the awe-inspiring display of strength and power exhibited by the custodian. She understood why they were regarded as the elite guards of the emperor and caused fear among the supernatural factions. Nonetheless, her thoughts were abruptly interrupted by another custodian, bringing her back to reality. Custodian 1. Lady Karara, we're ready to proceed. Karara, regaining her senses, immediately rushed inside to search for her fellow yakai and her two daughters, Kuroka and Shirin. When she found them, she noticed their surprise at the force used to open the door, but they quickly realized that Karara had come to save them, bringing them relief and reassurance of their safety. However, Karara's heart sank when she discovered that her youngest daughter was not among the captive yakai in the dungeon. Kuroka, one of the captives, called out to Karara. Concern etched in her voice, Karara inquired about Kuroka's well-being and urgently asked for information regarding the whereabouts of her missing sister. Kuroka. Sniffs they moved her to another part of the mansion. I couldn't stop them, I wasn't strong enough. Sniff, Lady Karara. Don't worry, sweetheart. You did everything you could to protect your sister and stop them. The Emperor's elite warriors are here with us and they will help locate her. You can trust them, I promise. Kuroka nodded, grateful for her mother's comforting words. At that moment, one of the custodians caught her eye. Custodian 2 reminded Lady Karara of their primary objective. To free everyone and guide them to the waiting evacuation ships nearby. Addressing the captive yakai, Karara assured them that the custodians of the emperor were present to rescue them and would provide protection until they reached their destination. Urging them to follow her and the custodians, she and her custodians began unlocking cages and removing chains, facilitating the captives' escape through the mansion towards the awaiting Thunderhicks. Custodian 1 established communication with the commander, delivering an update on the situation. He reported the successful rescue of the hostages. However, he also mentioned that the youngest daughter remained missing and requested further orders. Understanding the urgency of the situation, the commander prioritized the safe evacuation of the Nekamata and Nekashu. They instructed additional custodians to search the mansion for Karara's missing youngest daughter. The custodians swiftly relayed these orders to Karara. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Karara reluctantly accepted that their primary objective should be to ensure the safety of herself and the other yakai by reaching the Thunderhicks. Although her heart ached to search for her youngest daughter, she acknowledged the importance of following the commander's orders and trusted that the custodians would do their best to find her. Custodian 1 reassured Karara, emphasizing that the commander was aware of the situation and would dispatch custodians to search for her missing daughter. However, he emphasized that their immediate priority was to ensure the safe evacuation of Karara and all the yakai to the awaiting Thunderhicks. Though torn and filled with worry, Karara understood the gravity of the situation and chose not to argue. She knew that the safety of everyone depended on following the plan. With the custodians leading the way, she guided the yakai towards the Thunderhicks, focused on reaching safety. Scene change. Overwhelmed with frustration, Lord Nibirius realized that the Emperor's Golden Legion had unexpectedly arrived. Despite his irritation, he understood that time was of the essence. His paramount concern now was to swiftly complete the transfer of his valuable data onto the USB drive, ensuring that his years of hard work would not be undone by the relentless Golden Legion. As he focused on his task, a heart-wrenching sob caught his attention. It was Shirin, a young girl who had been captured and brought before him. In a fit of rage, he lashed out at her, gripping her by the hair and berating her for possessing innate power. He blamed her and others like her for the council's orders to abduct her, harboring a cruel desire to subject her to the same torment inflicted upon the Kitsunes, who had assisted human psychers in their desperate bid to escape, towards the end of the Great War. Terrified and overwhelmed, Shirin could no longer contain her anguish, her cries reverberated throughout the room. Lord Nibirius capitalized on her vulnerability, threatening to harm her and scheming to rob her of her innocence, before ultimately ending her life. The situation appeared bleak for Shirin, with no glimmer of hope for escape. However, just as Lord Nibirius poised himself to assault her, the door to the room was abruptly blasted off its hinges. In an instant, Lord Nibirius was sent hurtling through the air, and Shirin found herself enveloped in the protective embrace of a towering figure donned in resplendent golden armor. Overwhelmed with a flood of relief, she buried her face in the guardian's sheltering arms, releasing all her pent-up emotions through a cascade of tears. The accompanying custodians, cognizant of the grave circumstances, were consumed by a righteous fury. Approaching Shirin tenderly, the team leader reassured her that their presence was to ensure her safety. He revealed that they had arrived to rescue her and the other captured yakai, along with her mother. 
The custodian, currently holding the little cat Yakai, extended solace, giving her gentle pats on her head. Team leader. Sensing the pressing urgency of the situation, issued a directive to his custodian, instructing him to escort the cat Yakai to the awaiting Thunderhicks while they dealt with the Lord. He vowed to inform their commander of the disturbing revelations they had uncovered, guaranteeing swift and decisive measures would be taken. Custodian. Understanding the seriousness of the situation, he hurriedly removed the frightened girl from the unfolding scene, swiftly exiting the mansion towards the waiting Thunderhicks. He remained determined. He would reunite the girl with her mother, granting her the safety and comfort she desperately sought. Team Leader. Commander, reporting in. Commander. Any updates on the target? Team Leader. The target has been found and restrained. We discovered him in the midst of transferring data and collecting files onto a USB. Currently, we are extracting and transferring the information from his computer to his device. Once completed, we will bring it back to base for further examination. Commander. Excellent. Complete your task and head to your designated extraction point. We will demolish the mansion once everyone is safely out of there. Team Leader. Acknowledged. Furthermore, I would like to apprise you of the successful discovery of Lady Carrara's youngest daughter. Presently, she is being accompanied by one of our team members as they make their way towards the Thunderhex. Commander. Understood. I will order the search squad to return and regroup at the designated extraction point where the Orion assault dropships await. Our mission to rescue the hostages has been successfully accomplished. Your responsibility now is to confront the Lord and retrieve any imperative information, research, or other significant items. Afterward, you and your team must proceed to evacuate the mansion and head towards the extraction point. I will personally inform Lady Carrara of the update regarding her daughter. Team Leader. Affirmative, Commander. Communication ends. The team leader then proceeds to Lord Nibirius, who is restrained, and announces his sentence. Team Leader. Lord Nibirius, for your numerous heinous crimes, including torture, murder, and your despicable intentions towards a child, you are sentenced to a painful death. In the name of the Imperium of Man and our revered Emperor of Mankind, you shall endure unimaginable torment. The team leader carries out the administration of a lethal injection of dark green fluid to the condemned individual. May your suffering be severe, and may your victims find solace and closure, as his pain endures throughout the remaining duration of his wretched existence. After the virus was injected into Lord Nibirius, his physical form, from flesh and bones to his genetic molecular structure, went through a continuous process of reconstruction, rewriting, reshaping, reforming, and destruction. This caused his body to contort, bones to break and reform into different shapes, all while he was still alive and screaming in unbearable agony. The pain he experienced surpassed anything Hades could come up with. It was a torment he would endure, magnified a thousandfold, refusing to let him die, until someone forcibly released him from his misery. This was a fitting punishment for a vile individual who had tortured human psychers and kitsunes during the Great War and attempted to do the same to Nekashu and Nekamata. The screams echoed throughout the mansion, reaching even the custodian stationed outside until eventually, his own voice box began to undergo deformation, rendering him unable to even scream in pain. Team leader. All right, gather all the necessary information and let's proceed to the designated extraction point to board the dropships. The team swiftly gathers the required information, completes the data transfer, and heads towards the extraction point. They carefully observe the strategically placed charges inside the mansion as they make their way outside, where the Orion assault dropships are waiting for their departure. Scene change. Outside the mansion, the last Thunderhex stood ready for departure, confirming the successful rescue of all the Yakai. Lady Carrara, accompanied by her Kuroka, anxiously awaited any news about her daughter. Just then, the commander approached with news that her daughter had been found and was on her way to them. Moments later, the custodian from the kill team arrived, carrying little Sheeran in his arms. Custodian. Commander, Lady Carrara, I have brought the girl. Lady Carrara. My little girl. Kuroka. Little sister. Upon hearing her sister and mother's voices, Sheeran freed herself from the custodian's grip and ran to them, seeking their embrace. Sheeran. Mommy, I was so frightened I thought I would never see your big sister again. Lady Carrara. SHHH, my child, I am here now. Everything will be alright. The commander congratulated the custodian on successfully bringing back Lady Carrara's daughter. Custodian. Commander, you should know that we have decided to ensure that the perpetrator suffers a painful and agonizing death before the explosives detonate. Before we apprehended him, we overheard him speaking to the little girl. To say that we were enraged would be an understatement. Had we not arrived in time, he would have violated the poor child before killing her. We intervened before any harm could be done. Commander. I am aware. The team leader informed me about the situation, and I completely agree with your actions. Garoka expressed her gratitude to the custodian who had successfully located and returned her sister. The custodian, displaying a gesture of respect, lowered himself in front of the young yakai. 
Placing a hand gently on her shoulder, he began to speak. Custodian. Thanking me is unnecessary, for my duty and loyalty lie with the Emperor. Without his command, we would not be here today. However, this does not mean that we lack compassion for the Yakai race. We are aware of the sacrifices made by the Kitsunes and the Yakai during the Great War in their efforts to preserve humanity. It is the will of the Emperor to repay our debt and show kindness to all, regardless of their nature. Therefore, there is no need for you to bow, as you are under the protection of the Emperor and a part of his domain. As custodians, we are not only elite bodyguards of the Emperor, but also defenders of humanity. We will protect you in the same manner. Rest assured, we would never allow such an atrocity to befall your sister, we would have intervened regardless. Upon hearing this, Kuroka ran up and embraced the custodian. The custodian reciprocated the hug until the commander intervened, reminding everyone of the present situation. Commander. While your words bring me joy, my brother, we must focus on evacuating these girls. Lady Karara, now that your daughter has been reunited, I need you to board the last Thunderheck and leave this place. Our diversion and bombing Lilith's capital city has served its purpose, but soon the enemy will be here. The atrocities committed here will be rendered as mere remnants of a once thriving place. You are the last group of Yakai that needs to evacuate, as the other Thunderhicks have already departed. The custodians will finalize the charges and join you in our dropships, headed for the base. With that said, I need you to leave now on this Thunderhick so we can carry out the rest of the plan. Understanding the urgency, Karara nodded and hurriedly ushered her daughters onto the Thunderhick. As the doors closed, they waved farewell to the commander and the custodian, grateful for saving little Shirin from a dreadful fate. With its fighter escort, the Thunderhick took off, leaving the underworld behind. Commander. Now that they have left, we can begin the final preparations. I have already informed the remaining custodians and your team is on their way. Most of the charges have been placed, and I believe the others have been positioned as well. The Orion assault dropships have been called to transport us out of here. One of the dropships will meet the custodial detachment on the west side of the mansion to bring them back, while you and the custodians who have already arrived, along with your kill team, will head to the east side of the mansion to be evacuated by our assigned dropship. It is time for us to leave. We have carried out the Emperor's orders and obtained valuable information. We now need to receive a briefing from your team leader and discuss the data acquired by your team. However, for now, we must wait. After some time, the rest of the custodians gathered at their extraction points, boarded their designated dropships, and swiftly departed as the devils arrived to investigate the chaos. Meanwhile, high above the Nibirius estate, the commander, standing inside the cockpit of the Orion dropship, looked at the Nibirius mansion with anger. The commander resolved that it was time to destroy this abhorrent place that had caused so much suffering and harm to innocent people. It must never be used to commit such atrocities again. He then pressed the button. As a result, a massive explosion engulfed the mansion. The entire estate was ravaged by explosions, and the shock waves and explosions could be felt and seen across the underworld. After the flames subsided and the dust settled, all that remained was a huge crater, erasing the former Nibirius estate completely. Afterward, the commander and his custodians returned to their fortress in the Himalayan mountains. They landed in the hangar, disembarked the dropship, and proceeded to brief the emperor and other important individuals on the mission's progress, as well as their findings and additional information. One month has passed since the rescue of the Nekamata and Nekashu, and the subsequent attack on Lilith, the Devil's capital. Now, the Devil Kings and the Devil Council anxiously await the arrival of the Emperor and his escorts to discuss the events that unfolded and the questionable motives behind the attack on the capital city. Seraphal, visibly distressed, contemplates the assault that occurred last month on the Nibirius estate and their esteemed capital. She expresses her frustration towards the abhorrent actions of the Golden Legion and their heinous acts. Seraphal also laments the innocent devils who were tragically caught in the crossfire. As she peruses the report before her, she notes the recently updated casualty figures, which now amount to 278,996, excluding the significant losses suffered in the military. Ajuka, in a sad tone, raises further concerns about the recent attack and emphasizes the need to acknowledge its severe consequences. According to the damage report, our city has experienced a significant blow, with 60% of its areas being deliberately targeted and 25% completely destroyed. Additionally, it took several weeks to both control and extinguish the extensive fires, which alone accounted for an extra 35% of the overall damages. Albiam adds that our military forces, deployed to protect the city and counter the assault, suffered severe losses. Reports indicate that we lost a total of 68,845 military personnel, including both the already stationed forces and the reinforcements sent from different territories. The Legion's advanced weaponry, such as their formidable airships and overwhelming destructive power, proved to be too much for our forces. 
This loss, coupled with the loss of sacred gears from our reincarnated devils, has placed us in a dire situation. As Ekram, addressing Ajuka, inquires about the newly modified sacred gear system mentioned in Ajuka's report to the council. This modification made it impossible for humans who have transformed into devils to use their sacred gears any longer. In light of this development, Sirzich as Lucifer, how do you propose we navigate this precarious situation? As the council members contemplate the gravity of the situation, council member one suggests mobilizing an assault on the emperor's military stronghold and headquarters. Simultaneously, council member two asserts that heaven must also be targeted in retaliation for this offense against devilkind. They refuse to be subjugated by the emperor or the human race he seeks to elevate. Council member three, firmly grounded in the belief of devil superiority, proclaims, we cannot allow humanity to degrade our status or undermine our power. The Emperor's arsenal and his human allies are mere pawns for our manipulation and amusement, Serzich's. Enough we must not risk our entire race by attacking the Emperor's forces without careful consideration. The Emperor's effortless elimination of half the fallen angels demonstrates his immense power. We must contemplate the potential consequences of engaging in battle without a strategic advantage. Our numbers are already strained, despite having the evil pieces to replenish our ranks. Furthermore, Falbium highlighted our significant losses and shortcomings during the previous assault, revealing our inability to match his forces. Moreover, the devils we reincarnated with sacred gears can no longer wield them due to modifications to the system made by the Emperor. Engaging in a futile battle would be foolish. Zekram Beal, I implore you to ensure our council remains compassed upon the Emperor's arrival. Even with myself, Ajuka, and all others present, it remains uncertain if we could even stop the Emperor. Suddenly, a knock resounded at the door of the assembly hall. Devil guard. Honorable devil kings and council members, the emperor and his escorts have arrived. Serzichas took a deep breath and sighed. Let them in. As the assembly hall doors swung open, the golden-clad members of the emperor's elite guard, known as the Adeptus Custodians or the Golden Legion, were revealed. These imposing guards, ranging from 9 to 10 feet in height, some even taller, were adorned in elaborate golden power armor. Their weapons included guardian spears, sentinel blades, and massive golden shields adorned with the Imperium of Man's iconography, leaving the devils in awe of their strength. Each custodian wore a long red cape along with their armor. Accompanying the Emperor were twenty custodians, led by the infamous Legion commander Constantin Valder. Standing beside Valder was the god Emperor himself, accompanied by the notorious Malkator the Sigilite, one of his closest advisors. After some amount of time, the assembly hall was filled with esteemed figures, including the Emperor, Malkator, and Valder. The Emperor's elite guards were prominently placed behind him, poised to act at a moment's notice, should the devils dare to make a move against their Emperor. A heavy silence hung in the air until, finally, the Emperor broke it with his commanding voice. Devils, I have received your message summoning me to this meeting in the depths of the underworld, the Emperor began, his deep voice resonating throughout the chamber. The devils in the room seethed with restrained anger, but managed to maintain their composure. It was Seraphal, the devil responsible for foreign affairs, who found the courage to speak up. We appreciate your presence, esteemed God Emperor, and are grateful that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to join us for this meeting, Seraphal respectfully acknowledged. However, we have gathered here today to address a serious matter that transpired a month ago. Your Golden Legions launched an unprovoked and bold attack on our capital city, resulting in the tragic loss of thousands of innocent devils, including our Lord. We seek an explanation for this indiscriminate act of destruction. The Emperor's unwavering gaze gave no insight into his thoughts, his face betraying no emotion. In a compassed manner, he replied, were you not informed by the Council regarding their assignment to apprehend the Nekashu and Nekamata, as well as their deplorable actions of subjecting them to merciless experimentation? Furthermore, there was an incident when the Lord attempted to harm an innocent young girl, along with their sinister intentions of committing genocide against the Nekashu and Nekamata. One of the council members interrupted, vehemently denying the accusations as mere falsehoods propagated by a mortal who deludes himself into thinking he possesses divine abilities. However, before the devil could finish his statement, Valder, the formidable leader of the Emperor's custodians, swiftly attacked the council member with his guardian spear. In an instant, the unfortunate devil's body was torn, filling the room with blood. The attendees of the assembly, including the council members and the kings themselves, were left speechless and in shock. The speed and expertise with which Valder disposed of the council member left the rest of the devils trembling with fear and admiration, realizing the true power and capabilities of the emperor's elite custodian guards. Now, I suggest you devils mind your words and allow my lord to continue speaking, Valder spoke with a stern warning, his gaze scanning the rest of the council. Soon, you will comprehend that you bear responsibility for the crimes committed. The emperor raised his hand, signaling Valder to stand down. 
The loyal custodian promptly returned to his position by the emperor's side, a silent sentinel poised to defend his lord at any given moment. Enough, the emperor asserted, his voice carrying a conclusive tone. The atmosphere in the room was tense as the devils anxiously awaited for what the emperor would say next, uncertain of the fate that awaited them. Emperor. Lord Niberius is a treacherous individual who, in collaboration with several councilmen, has engaged in a complex scheme. He provided information to both the Great King faction and the Old Satan faction regarding the creation of super devils. Moreover, he betrayed the Devil Kings by working for the council and collaborating with the Old Satan faction. I possess concrete evidence of his actions. The Emperor then signaled Valder, who retrieved a device from his belt. With a quick motion, the device projected holographic images depicting the gathered information, effectively revealing Lord Niberius's connections with both factions and their joint plan to overthrow the Devil Kings. After showcasing the evidence for a brief period, the Emperor switched off the device, leaving everyone speechless. This revelation instilled fear in many, as their secrets were exposed, and anger in others who understood the ramifications it would lead to. Serziches, this situation is indeed overwhelming. Lord Niberius's treacherous actions have been exposed, yet we cannot overlook the fact that you not only targeted innocent devil civilians, but also unleashed a devastating attack on our capital, which resulted in approximately 60% of the city's destruction and the loss of countless military and civilian lives. Emperor. Ha 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 ha, I find that quite amusing. Ajuka. Do you find amusement in the fact that so many lives were lost while claiming to protect innocent Yakai lives? Malkader. Please be mindful of your tone, devil. Although you may possess immense power as a super devil, when compared to the emperor, you are nothing more than an insignificant ant. It is akin to a pebble attempting to fight against a mountain. Emperor, your actions and treatment of humanity towards the end of the Great War paralleled the actions of the council towards the Nekamata and Nekashu. The council invaded Yakai territory, captured its people, and subjected them to imprisonment. If I hadn't intervened and rescued them, they would have undergone inhumane experiments in an effort to exploit their power. Once it became apparent that the council couldn't possess this power, they would move to eliminate them, so they would not become a three. Ajuka. Enough. He refused to tolerate such blatant disrespect towards the lives of devils. He prepared to take action, but before he could do anything against the emperor, the emperor displayed his power to the super devil. Before Valder, his custodians, or even Malkader could intervene, the emperor had already acted. His eyes emitted that ethereal blue light once again, with sparks of blue shooting out from them. He propelled Ajuka towards a wall, pinning him there. As the Emperor approached the restrained devil, he spoke to him. Emperor. How pathetic, I expected more from a super devil, you don't even come close to matching even a fraction of my power. You boast of your intelligence and your power as a super devil, but in comparison to the might of a human psyker or the collective strength of humanity, you are nothing. So, tell me, devil, oh great Beelzebub, show me your true power, demonstrate that famous Kankara formula that grants you control over my powers, if you can. Ajuka attempted to comply, but all he received was a shock, courtesy of the Emperor. Emperor. Your boasting about manipulating others' abilities is pitiful, akin to the shortcomings of supernaturals who fail to comprehend the full potential of humanity and their unique gifts. Your understanding remains limited. You are merely the creator of the ill-intentioned evil peace system, which is rather laughable. Please relinquish your inflated sense of superiority and the expectation that everyone should bow down to devils. It is ironic that you rely on humanity while concurrently looking down upon them. Understand this. Humanity will not be a crutch to save your dying race. Soon, humanity will unite under my banner, the Imperium of Man. And your race will gradually fade away, unable to lean on the crutch that you both detest and exploit for your own needs. The era of servitude to supernatural beings is drawing to a close. I have conveyed this message to the fallen angels as well. The age of the supernatural is coming to its end, while the ascendancy of mankind is imminent. Prepare to be subjected to the might of humanity, as that is my solemn pledge. Amidst these events, Malkader received a psychic message from Erda. Erda. Malkader, can you hear me? Malkader. Yes, what is it? The Emperor has instructed you not to contact him unless it is important. Erda. Well, tell that golden jackass that his son is starting to awaken. Malkader. Wait, you mean the boy is finally waking up? Erda. That's what I said now tell him to finish up and come down here immediately. Whether he wants to embrace his role as a father or not, he must at least pretend to be one. Malkader. Your behavior is unbecoming and unladylike, Erda. Erda. I'll show you unladylike, old man. I'm finally going to meet my new son and be a mother. I won't let your sly comments, or that golden jackass, ruin this for me. Both of you better act like proper role models when you meet the boy or else. Malkader. I understand. I will inform the emperor of the news, and we will be there shortly. We will finish what we're doing. 
Also, you should know that it is unbecoming for a new mother to speak so crudely in front of her child. Erda. Why, you old boss, Malkader? At that moment, cut off the mental link between them and sighed. That woman will be the death of me. Baldur, who had observed Malkader's mental communication and the ensuing silence, decided to ask him about it. Baldur. Malkader, what was that about? Malkader. The boy is waking up, and Erda insists that we, particularly the Emperor, be present. Baldur. I assume you find it tiring to handle her new personality and newfound maternal instincts towards the boy who is now her son. Malkader. Yes, it is true that her personality has undergone a significant transformation after learning of the boy's survival. The procedure he underwent was successful, allowing his body to accept the infusion of new DNA that combined traits from both her and the Emperor. However, dealing with this change has proven to be quite exhausting for me. Baldur. Personally, I find it delightful. It's refreshing to witness her liveliness. In the long run, I believe you will come to appreciate this shift in her character, as will all of us. Even the other custodians have embraced her new personality and anticipate the connection they will form with the boy. Meanwhile, with the Emperor and Ajuka. Emperor. Observe, devils, how I have made one of your strongest devils rendered defenseless and entirely vulnerable to my whims. Serziches. That's enough. You have made your point. Just release him. Emperor. Very well. I did not come here with intentions of killing any of you, at least not today. I promise that as long as you refrain from obstructing me or humanity, I will not meddle in your affairs. But if you impede my path, I will show no mercy. But that, he releases Ajuka. Seraphal and Falbium rush to their friend's side, ensuring his well-being, but he is visibly shaken from the ordeal. Seraphal. Are you alright? Ajuka, gazing at the Emperor. No, I'm not. Even with a mere glimpse of his power, I felt pure terror. His might and strength left me utterly defenseless. With a snap of his fingers, he could annihilate us all. Falbium. Can he truly be that formidable? Ajuka. Unfortunately, he surpasses our expectations. He could likely contend with Great Red and emerge victorious. I cannot comprehend why one would crave such power. The thought that there may be even mightier beings out there is terrifying. Seraphal. That is ominous and terrifying. It is best for us to steer clear of his path. Falbium. I concur. We must address the council and their exposed plot to overthrow us. The revelation of the Great King faction colluding with the old Satan faction to artificially create super devils and launch covert attacks on other factions without the Devil King's knowledge has already ignited the seeds of a new civil war. Seraphal. Damn it, I thought we could finally have some peace for our people to recover. But it seems that's not meant to be. Ajuka and Falbium. They both had the same thought. They wanted a few years of peace, but it seems unlikely due to what has been revealed today. Back with the Emperor and Serziches. Upon receiving the mental message from Malkader, the Emperor was promptly notified of Erda's revelation about the boy finally regaining consciousness. Understanding the urgency to visit the boy after the procedure, the Emperor realized that this turn of events presented an opportunity to put one of his previously planned schemes into action. Originally intended for a later time, the current circumstances demanded a change, making it the perfect moment to sow the seeds of a civil war among the devils. With this in mind, the Emperor handed Serziches a copy of the hologram-producing device, along with vital documents. Serziches, his gaze narrowed suspiciously, questions the Emperor's motives behind his actions. The Emperor calmly responds, revealing that the Devil Council, in collaboration with the old Satan faction, has conspired to overthrow both Serziches and the other Devil Kings. Presenting this information to Serziches, the Emperor intends to provide him with a valuable resource. Furthermore, the Emperor declares that certain territories of the human world, including the Yakai, have fallen under his growing imperium. He grants Urzichas and any affiliated devil companies or businesses a 15-day period to sever all ties with his imperium. Failure to comply will result in the execution of any remaining devils within his territories, including strays. The Emperor emphasized that the East and West Yakai factions, as part of his imperium, were under its protection and sovereignty, assuring their safety. He warned Serziches that any further attempts by the Devil Council to harm the Nekashu or Nekamata would incur the full might of the Imperium of Man. The Emperor concluded by affirming that swift and merciless retaliation would follow any foolish actions from Serziches Council, demonstrating the wrath of the Imperium of Man. Serziches. Thank you for providing this information. If you truly keep your promise to refrain from interfering in our affairs, we will withdraw our companies, assets, and devils from those territories. We will not harm the Yakai nor show aggression towards the Imperium of Man. After witnessing your display of power, I am not foolish enough to challenge you or underestimate you. Emperor. Very well, I will take my leave now as I have other matters to attend to. Just remember, devil, heed my warnings. Any interference with humanity, the Yakai race, or any of my allies, will result in the devils being nothing more than a footnote in history. 
Surzich is nodded in agreement, feeling a cold sweat on his forehead. Following this, the Emperor, along with his custodian escorts consisting of Baldur and Malkadur, departed in the Thunderhex to return to the human realm and attend to their matters. They entrusted the devils to confront their own predicaments, as the Emperor had informed them about the conflict unfolding between the King and Old Satan factions that sought to overthrow the Devil Kings. The Council's treachery instigated an impending civil war that would soon engulf the underworld. The Emperor was confident that his new plan was already working out. Now, he needed to see the boy he rescued two months ago and observe the changes he had undergone after being the first one to successfully survive the gene evolution procedure. But Elohim's words echoed in his head again. Do not raise him as a mere tool or weapon, or even just as a champion for humanity. Raise him as your own son and shower him with love. This will lead to the best possible outcome for all. Emperor. Well, my old friend, no reason to doubt your words. I'll strive to be a good father to the boy. Scene end. Issei finally woke up and would begin his training, living with his two new parents in a pivotal role in the story. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.